Uh, since there's no one to introduce me, you have to read my own titles. I'm Alina, Canada born of House Chan, <laughs> disruptor of biology, doctorate of molecular biology, postdoc of synthetic biology, fellow of human frontier science program, and mother of human artificial chromosomes. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about my hack that can shadow the three kingdoms. So what I spent the last two years of my life working on hacks, it's because I believe they are an essential foundational technology for genome writing and mammalian cell engineering. This is the most efficient way forward to synthesize megabases of DNA and overcome that bottleneck of delivering them into human cells. But more significantly, in my process of building them, I found that it is a brutal test of our knowledge of human biology. You just cannot build what you don't understand yet. In particular, we're building a hack that can shuttle the three kingdoms. So uh, we want them to be able to go into bacteria, yeast, and humans. We don't want to do our cloning in humans, where it's slow and inefficient uh, and problematic. We want to do it in bacteria and yeast, where we've done it for many years and are really good at doing it. We want to leverage on technologies we already have to build chromosomes and even genomes in yeast using uh, transformation-associated recombination cloning. And recently, we've optimized a method to fuse yeast to human cells and deliver not just those megabase-sized constructs, but also functional proteins. So take that for Frankenstein cells. Um, in a very specific case study, what we did was to fuse uh, yeast that carries a herpes genome as well as yeast that carries the Ebola VP35 protein to human cells. And what we accomplished with that was to show that you could make human cells produce infectious virus only when you deliver it both the herpes genome in combination with the uh, virus protein from Ebola, because that shuts down antiviral pathways in humans. And so this is just one example, but you can imagine the kind of combinatorial uh, toolkit for human cell engineering you could build using many different types of yeast with protein factors and different genetic constructs. So this was our herpes Ebola yeast hybrid uh, published last year. Uh, so I've explained that we can build and deliver megabase-sized constructs, but we still need the hack technology, a hack that can efficiently shuttle from yeast and bacteria, and then efficiently establish itself in human cells. So we don't have that right now. We have hacks that are great. Uh, however, they cannot shuttle from yeast to bacteria and back and forth. So there's some limitations to that. Uh, so this is my hack prototype. You can all start taking photos and stuff. Uh, <laughs> just not get into too much technical detail here. It's built on a yak, a yeast artificial chromosome, to enable cloning in bacteria and yeast. Uh, it's got mammalian uh, or human cell selection markers, like a green fluorescent protein, GFP, as well as a blastocytin drug resistance gene. But the most important part of a hack, like any human uh, chromosome, is the centromere. So the centromere is what helps your newly replicated chromosome go into each of the daughter cells during cell division. Without that, you don't have a functional chromosome. So uh, the most important thing to note about human centromeres is that it's not just a genetic sequence requirement like it is in bacteria and yeast. You actually need epigenetic or protein interactions with your DNA. And so that was a really tough part to figure out. And based on the knowledge that we have about human centromeres, we tried two different uh, proteins. One was a SNPA histone-like protein that we normally find at human centromeres. And the other is it's a babysitter, the chaperone for SNPA, which is called h -trip. Uh But to protect the structure of the whole hack, to make sure that the centromere doesn't run off into your gene expression region, we had to include insulators as well that flank the centromere. This prevents your epigenetic modifications from spreading. OK, so moving on to the centromere in more detail. Uh, this is really the first of its kind entirely de novo centromere. It did not rely on uh, repetitive amplification. It also did not rely on excising or extracting naturally existing uh, centromeres from human uh, chromosomes. So what we did here was to use the 171 base pair consensus sequence of uh, human centromeres and retain only the most important motifs but wherever else we could vary the uh, nucleosides, we went in and changed it as much as possible to remove repet uh, repetition. And serendipitously, there were two sites where we could just throw in lack all sequences, and this is what we used to target our uh, helper proteins to the centromere. Uh, I really have to give credit to Dan Gibson and his team at the Wentz Institute and SGI for this, because this was a very major feat in complex DNA synthesis. It's not something that you can just buy off uh, any synthesis company. Uh, and it took many months to build this, but it's a it's a good uh, we've established a protocol, and we want to move on from here to build even more complex uh, centromeres. So I mean, normally when I tell someone I I build a completely de novo 
Centromere or Dan Gibson did it, they're like, no way, you can do that. <laughs> so normally you just want to go and like, chop up Centromeres and amplify them to megabases in size. So, uh, so I finally got around to testing the hack. And uh, right now it's only 30 KB. So it's really small. It's comparable to most of your other uh, human vaccines. I lipofactamine transfected it into my human cells, selected with the drug, blastocytin for two weeks, and then took it off selection, sorted for just the GFP positive cells, and followed them for weeks afterwards. So one of the first observations I had was that insulators are extremely important. If you don't have them, even after blastocytin selection, you get drastically lower numbers of uh, GFP positive cells compared to other variants. So controlling that epigenetic modification is very important for building hacks. You can't just throw in DNA sequences. Uh, but here's the, the stunning result, which is that compared to all the other variants, when you have the centromere alongside h -trap, so that's the SENPA chaperone, you do get retention of your uh, GFP expression from the hack. And this goes on for months after taking off selection. Uh, in contrast, the others will maintain a, a low level. So we uh, think that these are due to recombinants rather than actually an independent hack. And one really amazing thing that happened was that we could take those hacks that have been in human cells for months and throw them back into E. coli bacteria. So you can see what's happened to the hack during that time or at least track the sequence. So right now we're working on analyzing that. Yep. So I've briefly told you about two years of work on the hack, but there's many more uh, potentials to get into. And we are looking for collaborators to help us build new hack variants and optimizers for different cells. And we are really excited to be part of the international consortium that's GP right, and we are currently distributing the hack through AdGene as well. So please come talk to me if you're interested. Uh, and let's see, let's thank all these people. So I had a lot of uh, crazy undergrads working for me <laughs> in the last year. Lots of people who helped me resurrect like ancient uh, scientific methods like sudden blots and pulse future. <laughs> <laughs> and also all the upper management, which here also includes Jeff, who just gave a talk just now. All right, um, that's the end of my talk. Yeah, thank you. In generating your centromere sequence, you said that you took some selective motifs that yep. showed to be enriched. Yep. Have you created a null of that, some type of control where you, thought, where you actually used sequences that weren't enriched, for example? And let me go ahead and mm. say another thing is because huge ERP has DNA binding properties. So I'm wondering if maybe yep. you've kind of um, given it some advantage because now you're finding a binding site that might be preferable for huge ERP. Yeah, I think those are really good points. Uh, so the first thing is trying different different variants of the centromere. Mm -hmm. And that's something we didn't have the bandwidth for because it was super high risk project and <laughs> a lot of money and time. So now that we've shown that it kind of works, we want to move forward and try those uh, different variants, like you said. And uh, with HDRP, we tried two types, one that was deleted for the DNA binding uh, domain, so we could just target it using like I, uh, and it worked equally well. So yeah, but I agree, it may have some uh, extra edit effect. Yep. So did you check size of uh, human artificial chromosome in human cells? What size? Oh, yeah. So that's why I tried to do all these ancient methods. Um, I'm still trying. Uh, but one thing I know is that when I shuttle it back into bacteria, the size is still the same. And in fact, some of them retain the entire sequence unaltered. Uh, some of them do look like they've uh, rearranged a little in the centromere, so I need to look at it. But the size is actually still 30 KB. So I'm unable to detect it through typical immunofluorescence or fish methods. Uh, great talk. A quick question. When you see them go in and out of the cells, do you see changes on, say, DNA methylation or any other changes on the hacks for their epigenetic state? Uh, I don't know that right now because when they go into bacteria, like, those modifications might be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm doing some chip experiments now, and mainly I'm looking for SENPA deposition on the centromere. And yeah. bacterial cells, you might see more methyl 6 adenosine because of their systems versus, say, methyl 5 cytosine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Looks like I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>